The theme of the story is the superseded scientific theory of spontaneous generation, which held that living creatures could arise from non-living matter. This theory was common and regular and was believed for two millennia until it was discredited by experiments in the mid-19th century. The doctrine was coherently synthesized by Aristotle, who compiled and expanded the work of earlier natural philosophers in various ancient explanations for the appearance of organisms. Although the theory was challenged in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was not until the work of Pasteur and Tyndall that it was discredited. Today, rejection of spontaneous generation is no longer controversial among biologists, and attention has turned to the origin of life early Greek philosophers attempted to give natural explanations of phenomena that had previously been ascribed to the agency of the gods, seeking the material principle or archie of things. Anaximander was likely the first Western thinker to propose that life developed spontaneously from non-living matter. Various ancient Greek philosophers held diverse beliefs about the origin of life. Anaximander of Miletus believed that fish or fish-like animals emerged from warm water and earth, and men were trapped inside those creatures until puberty. Anaximenes, his student, believed air was the vital elixir that gave life and thought to all creatures that emerged from a mixture of earth, water, and sun's heat. Xenophanes traced the genesis of humankind back to the period of transformation from fluid to the solid state of the earth, under the sun's influence, while Empedocles believed that life was generated spontaneously but was subject to trial and error on the other hand, Aristotle believed in hylomorphism, according to which every physical entity was composed of matter and form. He suggested the male seed imposed form passed down to offspring, and the female provided the material cause for reproduction nonetheless many creatures formed through spontaneous generation, according to Aristotle. The theme of the story revolves around Aristotle's theory on the spontaneous generation of living creatures from inanimate matter. He believed that every soul had a divine body different from the four elements, and this body was generated through the numine closed in the seed and the foamy matter in animals. While fire did not generate animals, any residue of an animal's nature possessed the vital principle that could generate life. Aristotle drew an analogy between the foamy matter in nature and the seed of an animal composed of water and pneuma. According to Aristotle, living things formed quickly when vital heat and air were enclosed in any substance, and the corporeal liquids in them were heated, causing a frothy bubble to arise. He theorized the spontaneous generation of various creatures from inanimate matter, including the testations that grew from mud, with each species differing according to the material they grew in. Despite descending views such as Athenaeus's, spontaneous generation continued to be a dominant view among philosophers and thinkers, and some Christian theologians even accepted it. Augustine of Hippo, for instance, cited biblical verses to support the idea of ongoing creation through spontaneous generation. In summary, the story focuses on Aristotle's theory of spontaneous generation and its implications, including the generation of living beings from inanimate matter and the role of vital heat and foamy matter in the creation of life. The theme of this passage is the history of beliefs surrounding spontaneous generation and how they were eventually debunked. In the past, many believed that animals could be generated from non-living things, such as mud, salt, or even decomposing cows. These beliefs were largely influenced by Aristotelian philosophy, which was popularized in part due to the availability of Latin translations of his work however, as more scientific discoveries were made and people began to question the validity of these claims, beliefs in spontaneous generation began to decline. Scientists such as William Harvey, who believed in the idea of life coming from invisible eggs, would eventually provide evidence that debunked the notion of spontaneous generation. The theme of this passage is the development of the theory of spontaneous generation and the subsequent experiments that proved it to be false. The style should be informative and precise, focusing on the scientific discoveries themselves and the scientists who made them. In 1729, it was observed that placing fungal spores on slices of melon produced the same type of fungi that the spores came from, leading to the conclusion that fungi did not come from spontaneous generation. In 1745, John Needham's experiments on boiled broths showed that when sealed after boiling, the broths would cloud, allowing the belief in spontaneous generation to persist. This was rigorously scrutinized by his peers, but many agreed. 
Lazaro Spallanzani modified Needham's experiment in 1768 to exclude the possibility of introducing a contaminating factor between boiling and sealing. Although he did not see growth, the exclusion of air left the question of whether it was essential in spontaneous generation. By the start of the 19th century, attitudes towards the theory were changing, and there was a growing belief that spontaneous generation was an exploded doctrine. Charles Cagnier de la Tour and Theodore Schwann's discovery of yeast and alcoholic fermentation in 1837, using the microscope to observe yeast cells undergo cell division, suggested that airborne microorganisms were responsible for fermentation, not spontaneous generation. Despite this, distinguished naturalists continued to support the theory. Louis Pasteur's 1859 experiment, in which he boiled a meat broth in a swan neck flask, settled the question of spontaneous generation. Minority objections were persistent, as the experimental difficulties were challenging, but the investigations of John Tyndall were decisive in disproving spontaneous generation. The main theme of the story is the scientific study of the origins of life from non-living materials. Experimentalists had different terms for this process, including heterogenesis and archibiosis. In 1870, Henry Charlton Bastian introduced biogenesis as a term for the formation of life from non-living matter. He disliked the negative connotations of spontaneous generation, which implied randomness and unpredictability however, Thomas Henry Huxley later proposed the term abiogenesis for this same process, leaving biogenesis to refer to the process by which life arises from existing life. The paragraph highlights the evolution of scientific terminology and the quest to understand the fundamental question of how life began.